from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz is standing by to talk about correcting low pH soils with a lime application ahead of winter wheat or alfalfa planting this fall. He'll look at how the target pH levels differ across the state and how that ties into lime source selection and application rates. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth returns with more input for you grain sorghum and soybean growers on late season insect control, centering on the arrival of sugarcane aphids and headworms in sorghum and podworms in soybeans. And later on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Dennis Patton will look at using compost in early fall. All that here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome once again to another Agriculture Today here on the K-State Radio Network. We are into the fall season, not quite technically, but you can tell that we're drifting into that season as we speak. And we have some thoughts for you wheat and alfalfa growers planting those respective crops in the weeks ahead. If you have low pH soils, you might want to consider amending those soils with a lime application. Now, this is a soil nutrient project that needs due consideration before investing. We've brought by, once again, crop nutrient specialist Dorval Ruiz Diaz of K-State Research and Extension to talk lime applications. And in either case, for winter wheat or for alfalfa, this can be an important crop input, Dorval. Yes, Eric, it is a key soil variable that we have to evaluate. And, and the first step really is to look at soil tests and, and see where we are in terms of pH. Uh, we have to keep in mind that pH will ultimately affect root development, uh, nutrient availability. So essentially, it's, it's one of the base soil parameters that we have to evaluate. And of course, lime application uh, will be the way to make corrections if we need to, again, based on soil tests. And, and it's something we, we should definitely plan ahead of, of time before planting. Uh, oftentimes, we tend to see some issues already develop uh, in both alfalfa that tends to happen in the spring when we, we, we start to see some of those problems. And, and in the case of winter wheat, it's also we tend to see some issues when we have a low pH problem. So it is something we need to think about ahead of time and obviously make uh, lime applications if needed. Low pH soils, uh, at one point those were relegated largely to one part of the state, but are you finding that that's more commonplace around the state? Yes, we do tend to see more uh, low pH uh, soils develop, even in regions where traditionally we tend to have higher pH, like central and western part of the state. And of course, this is a natural process that develops with uh, application of nitrogen fertilizer. So we do tend to see acidification develop over time. Uh, in terms of pH levels, however, uh, we do tend to divide the state basically in two regions, east of the Flint Hills and west of the Flint Hills. And one key difference between these two regions is that east of the Flint Hills, we tend to have low pH, uh, lower in the soil profile. Essentially, we can have subsoil, acidic subsoil conditions, which means we really need to be looking at maybe a little bit higher pH targets. We typically like to, for alfalfa, we like to see a pH of about 6-8 typically. Uh, so that will be typically our, our uh, target pH. Now, west of the Flint Hills, we do tend to see more of a calcareous subsoil. In other words, as we're going deeper in the profile, the pH tend to increase. That's just the the nature of the soils. And so we can go by basically with um, a little bit lower target pH. So we want to keep at least a pH of 6.0. That's kind of the general guidelines we follow. Going back to the two crops, uh, alfalfa and wheat, um, of course, um, we have to keep in mind that alfalfa is a legume. Uh, so we tend to emphasize pH uh, much more than other crops because of the legume. Uh, basically, uh, nodulation and, and nitrogen fixation is highly affected by pH 
conditions. So we, we need to pay attention to that. The other aspect in the case of alfalfa is that, of course, um, it's a crop that's going to be there for multiple years, uh, and it's a big investment. Planting alfalfa is, of course, a much higher cost than other crops, and so we want to make sure we have everything basically uh, ideal before we have that alfalfa planting um, in the fall. Highly important. How to achieve those target pH levels, though, depending on where you are in the state, as you said, Torvar, that gets back to liming rates and other uh, variables, right? Yes, and there are a few different factors here, and and of course we mentioned already soil tests. We we basically need need to start with a soil test, and um, if you uh, think about your soil test report, you're typically going to see a pH, and then there is a buffer pH. Uh, essentially, the pH uh, is telling you whether or not is uh, low, and and do we need to do anything about it? And the buffer pH is an indication that will give us the the approximate rate of lime that we need to apply, and so those are key components there. Uh, now if we thinking about rate of, of application, we also have other factors, uh, things like source of lime and terminology like uh, effective calcium carbonate, which we usually uh, hear a lot about that when we are talking about lime applications. Things like tillage as well. Are we incorporating that lime or is it going to be a no-till where we are applying on the surface? So those are key things we need to keep in mind. If we start about uh, talking about effective calcium carbonate, this is an important concept. And one of the main things with Lyme is that we do have different sources, and um, there could be a lot of variability between different sources of ag lime. Uh, some would be finer materials, more pure materials. Then we have things like uh, pelletized lime. We have things like liquid lime, basically from uh, water treatment plants that are uh, often used. Uh, and they all can vary a little bit in terms of the effect of on pH, and, and that's where the, uh, the uh, effective calcium carbonate concept comes in, where we basically try to take into account how pure that material is, as well as how fine the material is. Basically, uh, the finer the material, there's going to be more reaction in the soil, and the effect on pH is going to be bigger. So by using the effective calcium carbonate, we're basically trying to put everything in the same scale, if you will. And so going back to different sources... As long as we are talking about effective calcium carbonate rates, uh, we're basically putting everything in the same scale, in, and the all different sources should basically have the same effect. So that's one key concept that we have to keep in mind when we talk about Lyme applications. But the application method itself would play into the effectiveness of the treatment, wouldn't it? Absolutely, and, and that's where we basically talk. Uh, in the case of alfalfa, for example, if we can do... Um, uh, broadcast application and incorporate that lime is typically a lot more effective. We have to keep in mind that lime usually don't move very much. Its uh, solubility is not very high. And so if we uh, do surface application, typically the lime is going to uh, just interact with the upper two or three inches in the soil surface, which again, in many cases where pH is not too low, that should be sufficient. And we're trying to maintain essentially a optimum pH. Other cases where pH of the soil is too low, and we're talking specifically about alfalfa, ideally we need to do an incorporation of that lime to really get a good effect in, in deeper in the soil profile. So that's, that's a key factor. Now, if we're talking about surface uh, application versus incorporated lime, then the rate of application will also be affected. Typically, when we do uh, surface application on this, uh, in no-till systems, we uh, will basically cut in half the application rate. And this is important because uh, we can also have the, the, the other situation where um, very high applications may be affecting things like micronutrient availability and so on if we have very high applications without an incorporation of that lime material. So you need to contemplate that if you're in a no-till or limited till system, you really have to think that through likewise. So lots of things to consider. And these lime products also contain a couple of other nutrients, namely calcium and magnesium. Does one need to account for those as they would put on their lime? Is there any reason to pay attention to those? That's an excellent point, Eric. Uh, we always get this question about magnesium and calcium, and this could be important in some soils. However, for most of our soils in Kansas, calcium and magnesium availability uh, is really not an issue. And so for most of our situations, uh, really we need to be focusing about the 
potential for this lime source to uh, neutralize acidity in the soil and really not a factor uh, whether or not we are using dolomitic limestone, which basically provide magnesium versus uh, just a, a regular calcium carbonate. So again, it's not really a factor for us in, in our soils in Kansas. It still all comes back, though, to the investment because lime sources may or may not be handy for producers, depending on their location. So they'll have to work all of those numbers through beforehand. Yes, absolutely. And, the, and this is very important. And, and, and it's something we always emphasize in the case of lime. Like I mentioned earlier, pH is really a key factor in soil fertility. But at the same time, uh, we're often talking about a long-term uh, investment, if you will. And so the cost of that investment can be also high. So we need to keep that in mind. One thing that we see oftentimes with uh, our research is that uh, yield increase in one year may not necessarily be paying 100% uh, for that investment. But also you have to keep in mind that lime application may only need to happen every 8 or 10 years. So we really need to take into account how much effect uh, this lime application may have over multiple years rather than looking at just one or two years. Well, once again, wheat and alfalfa producers, it may well be an important preparatory step heading into seeding either of those crops here in the fall. But it all starts with a soil test to get a read on that pH level, then to determine whether a lime application would be of benefit to you and your cropping pursuits moving forward. There is an article on this very topic in a recent Agronomy e-update newsletter. You can grab a look at that at agronomy.ksu.edu. As always, Dorvar, thanks for coming over. Thank you. He's a crop nutrient specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, talking over some of the principles of lime applications in advance of wheat or alfalfa seeding. And indeed, with the changes we're seeing in the weather now, we are heading down that home stretch of the row crop production season. But that doesn't mean that you sorghum and soybean growers in particular should be letting up on your insect management. That's from our next guest, who will talk about what to be looking out for when we return here on the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and for you crop producers as we push ever so steadily now toward harvest time for our row crops. Some updated information on insect control that you might contemplate at this point with Jeff Whitworth alongside crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. We want to revisit a couple of topics and see where we stand with the insect pressure in these crops, and we'll pick up on some potential new considerations too, Jeff. But going back to corn leaf aphids and the sugarcane aphids, which may be attacking corn and grain sorghum respectively and making the distinction between the two, you're still getting questions about this, you say? Yes. First of all, good morning. Thank you for having me on. By the way, the crops are looking really, really good right now, but uh, I am still getting quite a few calls relative to aphids and sorghum especially, and sorghum headworms. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And we've talked about them before, but right now there are, it, it's kind of strange because there are still quite a few cornleaf aphids around. The cornleaf aphids, they get in corn, i.e. The, the name, but usually around the world stage. Usually we don't worry about them in corn. Usually then they get into sorghum around the world stage. A lot of times that will cause concern with growers because they can build up in pretty good populations. But one of the characteristics of the cornleaf aphid, as it is with the sugarcane aphid, they produce a lot of honeydew. And I always get calls about the buildup of this honeydew in the world stage just prior to sorghum producing a head. So a lot of times if there are enough of them and there aren't too many beneficials, 
the sorghum does have a problem just because it gets so st- sticky with the honeydew. But I've really never seen it be a field-wide problem. Now, this year, in 2020, it's probably been more field-wide and area-wide than I have seen it in years past. I, I'm assuming that's because of the weather. But there have been a lot of corn leaf aphids around in south central and north central Kansas. One of the nice things about it, however, there's a lot of beneficial insects also. And they seem to be, that's one of the easy ways to find corn leaf aphid populations. You look for swarming insects, and lots of times it's surfed flies or green lace wings or one of these other beneficials. And they're just swarming these corn leaf aphid populations, and they're doing a pretty good number on controlling them. The problem is corn leaf aphids, they reproduce parthenogenically. That means they're an aphid. So like sugarcane aphid, their populations can explode quite quickly because they don't have to take time to look for a mate. They don't have to take time to lay eggs or for the eggs to hatch. So those populations can stabilize or explode quite quickly, even though there's quite a few beneficials around. But there are a lot of them, and there are a lot of them producing honeydew. And now, in the last probably 7 to 10 days or 14 days, we're starting to see uh, sugarcane aphids come into the state, at least, from the south. The nice thing about it, again, there's a lot of beneficials because of the corn leaf aphids. But one of the problems is a lot of folks are still getting corn leaf aphid populations confused or mixed up with sugarcane aphids. And the easy way to distinguish would be what? Well, corn leaf aphids are kind of a gray, green, dark colored, and they're a little bit larger. And the sugarcane aphid is more of a yellowish white color. The sugarcane aphid is more in a colony, what you'd think of a colony on the underneath side of a leaf. Most of the corn leaf aphids by now, at least uh, this week, um, those colonies have been pretty well stripped of their colony type appearance and there's just individuals around just because of the, all the beneficials. And the beneficials have been working on the corn leaf aphids. Again, they're kind of a greenish dark color and they're more on the top sides of the leaves or They'll be more in the in the whorls of the sorghum. And the sorghum, again, around the state, what I've seen, there's lots of different uh, developmental stages of sorghum. Some of it's just coming into the uh, boot stage. Some of it's past soft dough and all stages in between. So that's something to keep in mind. But the corn leaf aphid mainly is in the, the sorghum fields that are still in the whorl stage or just as the boot stage or just in the in the flowering stages. I've never seen them build up in populations that are going to cause a problem or that would justify some sort of control. I'm not saying they would never do that, but in the 40 years that I've been doing this, and we've seen corn leaf aphids every year in corn and sorghum, I've never seen them field-wide in populations that would justify an insecticide. Now, sugarcane aphids, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they're still coming in. There's lots of different developmental stages of the sorghum right now. And the sorghum can be vulnerable from, well, just about any stage, but right now from the boot stage on to the sugarcane aphid, not the corn leaf aphid, the sugarcane aphid. And it's going to be on the underneath side of the leaf for the most part. The best way I find to to go out and monitor for sugarcane aphids, again, if you Look in a field and you see some shiny leaves. Go out and look above that shininess. That's the honeydew, and it's generally dripping down from the leaf above because they're on the underneath sides of the leaves. Or a lot of times you can see little swarms of lace wings, green lace wings, or swarms of surfed flies. Those are the beneficials, and they're working on those colonies also. So it, it depends on the beneficials, whether they're going to build up into colonies that would justify treating and, and that treatment threshold is a little bit different. You know, generally it's, you know, I don't know from boot to uh, flowering on, it's 20 to 30 percent infested uh, leaves. But remember, that's not just a plant here or there. That's field wide. And the beneficials are really helping. I mean, those beneficials, we have good populations just because of all the corn leaf aphids we've had earlier. Um, so they are really helping. But one of the problems we're just now starting to have with some of those plants are just getting into the flowering stage, we are seeing some headworms. That's one of the questions we have, whether you're going to spray for headworms, 
because it's going to kill all the beneficials that might help with the sugarcane aphids. So, you know, we've talked about this before, but it's it's a legitimate question that's not going to go away. The headworms or the corn earworms, they're going to infest sorghum heads between flowering and soft dough. So you have about a two-week window there when those sorghum heads are vulnerable to infestation by the larvae, the worms, the corn earworms, the sorghum head, whatever you want to call them. And they can do 5% loss per worm per head. So that's a known quantifiable loss. So, you know, you count the number of worms in, per so many heads, and that will tell you what your percent loss could be expected. Really pretty easy to way of doing. Actually, they're pretty easy to sample for. Just get a deep-sided white bucket, um, go by and shake the heads into the bucket. Remember how many heads you counted. Look in there and count the number of worms, and that will give you your percent uh, infested in how many worms per head. So then it's 5% per worm per head. The problem with spraying for headworms, that insecticide will kill the sugarcane aphids also. But remember, those sugarcane aphids are on the underneath side of the leaf for the most part. And a lot of them are down in the canopy. So Contact is a little spotty there. Yes. So you have to have enough carrier to get that insecticide down to, like you said, contact the insects because these are all contact insecticides. Um, so, f- number one, you're probably not going to get enough carrier to get down to kill all of the sugarcane aphids. Number two, they reproduce parthenogenically. So those populations can come back very quickly on the underneath sides of the leaves. There's no beneficials, and as soon as that insecticide uh, dissipates or loses its toxicity, um, they're going to start populating the whole plant, and there's not going to be any beneficials there to help them. So just keep that in mind. May have to make a judgment call here. You can only do so by observing what's going on, as Jeff says. Now, you've talked about the sorghum headworm, the soybean podworm, same past, different name, and you want soybean growers to be on standby there, too. Yes. Generally speaking, the corn earworm, sorghum headworm, soybean podworm, cotton bollworm, it's the same insect. But generally speaking, they prefer corn, it seems like, first. And then they will move to sorghum or soybeans, whichever is available to them at the stage when the moth's out laying eggs. So you got to watch your soybean plants. And the way we check for podworms feeding or stink bugs or anything else, make sure you take uh, one or three feet of plants and shake it vigorously over a white cloth and then count the number of insects that drop out in the row. That's the best way to do it. You really can't. I mean, you can go out with the I see guys are all time out with sweep nets. That's a good way to go out and see if there's some available. But if you pick up some in a sweep net, then you got to go back and quantify how many are there if you're going to consider justifying some sort of a insecticide application. But a lot of the soybeans, again, just like the sorghum, they're in various stages of development right now. So as long as those soybeans are putting on new pods, they can be out there feeding as long as there's green pods. Once they start drying up a little bit, senescing, they won't feed on them. It's kind of like the sorghum, you know, past the dough stage. It's too, the kernels or berries are too hard for them to feed on. Eventually, we will get past the point of these insects bringing pressure to bear on our crops, but we have a ways to go, to be sure. And we appreciate the update as always. Jeff, many thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, with us regularly here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. I'm glad to have you along with us once more. Eric Atkinson here, and on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
According to the USDA, despite the pandemic, the U.S. farm sector is projected to have stronger income for 2020 than a year ago. The latest projections for U.S. net farm income for 2020 show a nearly 23 percent increase from last year's levels due to higher government payments to producers and lower interest expenses. This according to the USDA's Economic Research Service, as reported yesterday. Net farm income for the year forecast to increase $19 billion to reach just shy of $103 billion. If the numbers hold, 2020's net farm income will mark the first time since 2014 that the sector broke that $100 billion mark, climbing out of 2016's low of $66 billion. Again, a key driver for this higher net farm income would come from those higher direct payments to producers beyond the crop insurance indemnities the USDA's Commodity Credit Corporation is projected to pay producers $37 billion in 2020. That's an increase of $14 billion above 2019 farm subsidies, those higher numbers coming mainly from the USDA's Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. The ERS calculation on government aid also forecast $5.8 billion in aid to producers under the Paycheck Protection Program, another $3.8 billion coming from the Market Facilitation Program payments that carried over from the 2019 sign-up. Looking at this report further, net farm income is rising even though farm cash receipts are expected to fall $12 billion or down about 3.3% in 2020. Livestock cash sales projected to decline 14% from the combination of cattle, hogs, broilers, and the dairy sector. Total crop sales are projected to increase $2 billion or 1% from last year, reaching $196 billion in total value, but those higher crop sales come mainly from fruits and other produce, as the USDA is projecting sales for corn to fall $3 billion in value, about 6.2% down from 2019, due mainly to lower prices. Wheat sales will fall $600 million, or 6.5%. Cotton will decline $500 million, or 7.3%. And soybeans will drop $200 million, or 0.7% in sale value. USDA experts are taking the first objective scientific look at this season's corn and soybean crops in the field. The USDA's Gary Crawford has more. For the upcoming September 11th crop forecast, Agriculture Department crop experts are out right now assessing corn and soybean field plots across the country, thousands of them. It's the first objective survey of those crops this year. Lance Honig with the USDA Statistics Service says soybeans and especially corn are at or well ahead of average development now. And in some cases, if crops are mature, experts are harvesting ears and pods and sending them to a lab for complete analysis. But even as the ear is developing, There are measurements that we can take out in the field, Uh, you know, ear length, uh, circumference of the ear, that even then will give us some idea of exactly not only how many ears we have this year, but again, an idea of how big or how heavy those ears are going to be. And the same applies for soybeans as well, except we're looking at pods instead of ears. Honig says with corn and bean development a little ahead of average, that should give the experts a little better shot at forecasting yields. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And a pair of new studies here at K-State will be bringing insight to farmers and producers who are seeking to incorporate industrial hemp as cattle feed. Interest has grown in hemp as a commodity, including as feed for animals, but FDA approval would be required before hemp could be fed to livestock. K-State veterinarian Hans Kudsi and a team of K-State researchers recently received $200,000 in a grant from the USDA to study concentrations of cannabinoids in livestock after exposure to industrial hemp. K-State veterinarian Mike Kleinhans, who is a professor of beef production medicine, says that while varieties of hemp may be planted for single or dual purpose. Uh, The uh, byproducts could serve as potential feedstuffs, but uh, they need to be studied as far as whether they're safe for utilization in cattle. We'll have Hans and Mike with us next week to talk more about this new project. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas soybean update. Here's Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Leo Booty is joining us. He is a senior from Kansas City, Kansas, and enrolled in the chemical engineering program at the University of Kansas and is involved in the KU Biodiesel Initiative. And Leo, what got you interested in getting involved in the KU Biodiesel Initiative? Well, you know, I had heard about the Biodiesel Initiative from some friends in school, and uh, I had the good pleasure of meeting uh, my mentor who runs the program. And, uh, you know, there were just really excellent people involved, and they had a serious hands-on approach to uh, renewable fuels, and that really got me interested. Now, the Kansas Soybean Commission has been a longtime supporter of this initiative as well. And we owe a lot of thanks to the Kansas Soybean Commission. They really enable us to do what we do at the KU Biodiesel Initiative, and that is not only producing great high-quality fuels, but also training the next generation of students who are going to enter the biodiesel industry someday. You have been named as one of the four new co-chairs selected to lead the National Next Generation Scientist for Biodiesel Organization. That's, that's quite an honor to have. It really is. And I was going to say exactly that. It's an honor and it's a real privilege for me. It's a really fantastic organization that's connected to the National Biodiesel Board. And what they do is they really enable uh, students such as myself, university level students at schools across the country to connect, to collaborate. We get to interact and network with uh, industry professionals and with uh, students and academics around the country. And that really is to the, the eventual goal of uh, seeing 6 billion gallons of biomass based diesel by 2030. That's the National mm-hmm. Biodiesel Board's goal to be able to do that, and you can be a part of that, too. It really resonates for me as a Kansan and with so much support that we've had from the Kansas Soybean Commission because uh, the vast majority of that biodiesel is produced from soybean oil, over 75% of it right now, and we're really proud of the fact that it adds 63 cents to the value of a bushel of soybeans to this day. How proud are you representing the KU Biodiesel Initiative that can be a part of this and can be a part of of the breakthroughs that they can have. Oh, I'm extremely proud. The organization is fantastic. Like I said, there's a lot of fantastic people, not just at KU, but at the other member schools uh, in the Kansas Biodiesel Consortium. Fantastic people at the uh, at the Kansas Soybean Commission and to be involved with something that is so integral to what the state of Kansas does and is a part of, that's really important to me. And be sure to register for a live Zoom event on September 10th at 4 p.m. to see how Leo, his fellow co-chairs, and other scientists are improving the world through science at biodieselsustainability.com. That's Leo Booty, involved in the KU Biodiesel Initiative. He's been our guest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today is back now, and it's our time once more to talk horticulture with our guest joining us via phone from his office in Olathe, eastern Kansas. Dennis Patton is along with us. He is the Johnson County Extension Horticultural Agent. As we talk about utilization and creation of garden and lawn compost, Dennis, and now that we're starting to ease into fall, this is something that folks start to think about, creating and using compost for that matter. That is correct. You know, this time of year, we start thinking about the in-lawns, uh, renewing them for the coming year. We kind of start thinking about the end of the vegetable garden season. And of course, then we start, you know, as gardeners are always optimistic. So what can we do to make our lawns, make our gardens thrive better the next year? And good old organic matter compost is probably one of the best things we can do for our local soils that, as we know, tend to be fairly heavy clay content throughout most of the state of Kansas. Well, let's say that one has collected compost and been uh, building upon that compost pile. Actually, as one plants a new lawn, soil improvement could be achieved here, you say? That's correct. Uh, You know, we we think about a lawn as the soil being fairly stable. You know, there's not a lot we can do for it to help improve it once the lawn's there without starting over. And most of us don't want to take out the lawn, rototill, and start over. We just want to make what we've got better. And one thing you can do with compost is what we call top dressing, Uh, ideally done after core aeration of the lawn. But basically what you're doing is spreading maybe up to a quarter to half inch of compost throughout the yard, just kind of, you know, chicken feeding it out there, so to speak, that you're just going to allow that compost, not enough to cover the turf, but enough to give you a nice covering 
on the thatch layer to break it down. And then, of course, the old adage, kind of the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, and they'll work that compost down into the soil. And so it's just a good way to uh, help improve that organic matter content of the soil. Also, it gives a little bit of mulch buffering if you're going to be putting some seed down this time of year. But uh, it's called top dressing uh, of your lawn with compost, and it's a great thing to do in the fall. And about any compost that one might have on hand will accomplish this purpose, right? That's correct. You know, compost is made from a lot of different materials. You know, mostly it's just, you know, rotten uh, debris from the lawn garden, but it can also be, you know, manure based from feedlots, those type of things. But all the compost really is going to provide that same benefit, and it's that organic matter we're looking for, which has this wonderful uh, property of helping to release the bonds of that clay soil. It helps bring that aeration back in there for healthy roots, and, of course, it also holds a lot of water. So when we do have those dry Kansas periods, uh, we're able to retain that water a little bit longer with that compost in the soil. And compost will serve the same causes in our gardening areas as we put the finishing touches, say, on our vegetable production for another year or your flower beds and borders. Uh, Once that's all over with, a layer of compost can't hurt anything, can it? That is correct. You know, one of the best ways to improve our heavy clay soils, we just talked about on lawns, is through the addition of compost. And so as we're cleaning up our vegetable gardens uh, here at the end of the season, uh, one of the practices we a lot of times do is we'll till those, cultivate those to get a jump on next spring. And so a great thing to do is as you're tilling, working those soils this fall, is incorporate, you know, a good two to four inch layer of compost, organic matter, in that soil, you know, six, eight inches deep would be ideal because, as I said earlier about the lawn, the same, same adage applies. That compost makes that soil looser, so it's easier to get in there and till and plant. It holds water and aeration to help uh, provide healthy plants. And, you know, the, the sad part about compost is it's sometimes short-lasting, so it's almost like we have to do this almost every year. And then over time, we slowly get those benefits for a healthier uh, garden, one that's easier to work and and, and till. It does pay off. And if one does not have on hand their own compost resource, uh, there are places they can find compost probably more handily than they know, you say. Yeah, there are. You know, there are several municipalities throughout the state that have composting programs as a way to divert that from their local landfills or trash streams. And so a lot of times they will give those materials away for free or very low cost. Of course, you can also go out and buy bagged compost from garden centers. Now, unfortunately, that's going to be the most expensive way of uh, bringing compost into your, your yard. But, you know, Mr. Frugal Gardener, me, I like to either make my own in my backyard or search out those free, uh, low-cost sources that provide uh, the nutrient-rich material that we want to add to our soils. And to that option of creating one's own compost pile, this would be the time to think about how to go about that. Because, again, when fall comes on, more of that organic material will be around and available for homeowners, gardeners to utilize, Dennis. That's correct. You know, as the leaves start to come down here in the next month or two, uh, you know, a lot of people will rake those, they'll bag them, they'll throw them away. But, you know, that's kind of nature's bounty right there in your backyard that you can use your compost pile. So now's a great time to start planning ahead, coming up with some sort of device, container that will hold the material. You know, ideally, to start a compost bin, you'd want something that's probably no smaller than three by three by three. You know, the average compost bin is probably more like four foot by four foot, four foot deep. Then that will hold enough material, you know, whether it be the leaves, whether it be uh, some chopped up debris, uh, lawn clippings, whatever it might be, to help get enough mass to create that composting process that could be started this fall. And there is a procedure to this, layering that organic material, maybe some commercial fertilizer sprinkled in there to stimulate the brewing, if you will, of that compost. There is information out there that folks can uh, tap into to learn how to create compost for gardening purposes. That is correct. K-State Extension has uh, fact sheets, you know, the typical printed material. But in our Kansas Healthy Yards and Community section, there are a number of how-to videos on composting. For those who like to watch, you know, a short one- to three-minute YouTube-type video, 
there's all the information you need out there in, in starting or maintaining or even troubleshooting. If you have a compost pile that may not be uh, functioning uh, the way you think it should, there's advice out there on the K-State system. It really is an easy-to-accomplish process. Go to the K-State Horticulture website. You can access all of that good information on creating and or utilizing compost in your lawn and garden projects. Dennis, as always, thanks for checking in, and we'll talk again soon. Sounds good, Eric. That's Dennis Patton. He is the Johnson County Extension Horticultural Agent, and he's with us frequently for our weekly K-State Horticulture segment, which concludes our Thursday edition. We appreciate you tuning in and hope you'll be right back here this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.